introducing Kathy Wright. She knows she's a forensic anthropologist and she's the award-winning author of the Temperance Brennan novels and also the co-author of a teen fiction series called Virals that she co-authors with her son. She's the producer and creative inspiration behind the television series Bones and is in New Zealand promoting her latest book which is Bones of the Lost. So please join me in welcoming the extremely talented, professional and extraordinarily busy Kathy Wright. I just want to put, I'm going to keep my eye on these people over here that are behind my back. <laughs> I apologize for be, having my back turned to you. Well, we'll just have to kind of swivel like those clown toys. Yeah. <laughs> I thought we'd start by um, talking about your career, the forensic anthropology, because um, this is the, the basis pretty much for everything that you do. And back in the day when you started, you know, we all know what forensic anthropology is now through television programs and things, but it didn't actually really exist as such uh, when you first started out. So tell us about your, your career path. People were doing it. P uh, forensic and physical anthropologists were working for coroners and medical examiners. It just really wasn't a formalized discipline the way it is today. And when I studied, I got my PhD in bioarchaeology. I was planning to look at ancient skeletons my whole career. And then because I was the bones lady out at the university, um, when bones would turn up, the police would say, well, take, you know, take them out there. So that's how I how I got into doing the, uh, the law enforcement medical examiner coroner work rather than just the archaeological. So it would have um, been quite different being out in the field to, to having to, to, to formally try and formulate things so that the, the police and people could build a court case around it. Exactly. There are a lot, the, the basic skill set is the same. It's knowing about the human skeleton. But forensics involves a whole body of knowledge that you don't need as an archaeology how to process a crime scene, chain of custody, testimony in court. So you, at least in North America, it's become very important to have board certification because when forensic science became popular, somewhere back in the late 90s, I guess, a lot of people were just hanging out their shingles. And how do the courts decide who's a legitimate expert? So now we do have this process of formal certification. And you are one of the, not actually that many people who are, who are formally certified. The American Board of Anthropo Forensic Anthropology, I think we've now certified eh, in the low 90s, but there are maybe, I don't know, 75 of us actually practicing that. Now, being a forensic anthropologist, you tend to deal with the more messy end of the scale that you're dealing with bones or severely decomposed bodies. It must be... Um, Missing at times and <laughs> interesting. It, it, well, it's not for everybody. We have a strong stomach. Yeah, we don't just work with nice, clean bones. Um, we do the decomposed, the mummified, the dismembered, the, the uh, disfigured, the burned, the mutilated. Anytime a coroner, a pathologist, can't do a regular autopsy or a regular identification, that's when we come on the case. And is it just for regular or no? difficult identifications or where they have um, also having to deal with the difficult causes of death that's all in your field? Yeah, well, the two questions I address are who is it? If we get a completely unknown set of remains, um, most positive IDs are done with DNA or dental records, but you can't use those in a vacuum. You have to have a possible, you have to have a name, so you can go get that person's dental records, or you can go to that person's family for a DNA comparison sample. So if I, I get a completely unknown set of remains, I will give the investigating officer the, the, the race, uh, racial background, uh, the, the gender, the age, the height, any medical history I can. He or she can then match that profile to missing persons lists. And then, yo, maybe it's John Doe. Well, then we have a name, and then we can go get dental records or DNA or whatever. And then the second question, as you say, would be manner of death, cause of death. Looking, again, looking at the bones. Is it sharp instrument trauma? Is it blunt instrument bludgeoning? <coughs> is it gunshot wound? Is it strangulation? Anything that would leave the mark in the bones. And it's quite amazing to think that something like strangulation or a soft tissue thing can actually leave evidence on bone. Not all of them do. <laughs> poisoning doesn't, unless it's <laughs> long-term heavy metals like yeah. arsenic poisoning or something like that. But, yeah, but, uh, you know, if you've ever watched an episode of the TV show Bones, we open every single episode, and we're now in our ninth season, 22 episodes per season, so you can do the math. 
we open every single show with a body that somehow been messed up, but we magically, you know, find that minute little fragment of evidence and solve every case. So it has to be a uniquely messed up body. You know, it's really hard. You'll sit in the writer's room. When we start, um, we, we have at the beginning what's called the teaser, which is when the body's discovered. And we'll sit in the writer's room when we break what's called breaking a story. And we'll say, okay, let's, um, let's put it in a chocolate bar. And then we'll go, oh, no, wait, we did that. Okay, <laughs> let's wash it in the bleachers in the high school gym. Oh, no, wait, we did that. Let's put it, you know, in a cask of old red wine. Oh, no, we did that. You know, so it really takes creativity to come up with more and more bizarre ways to mess up remains. <laughs> and a seriously walked imagination. Yeah, probably. <laughs> now, you must get immense job satisfaction then, as a forensic anthropologist, in that you know that you are helping to identify someone and bring closure to a family or bring justice. So that must be a, a great career. Well, that's the gratifying part of the job, not the smells and the maggots and, you know. But being able to give families answers, they may not like the answers that we give them, but at least they, they know and they prefer to know. It does give closure if there is such a thing as closure. And then, of course, it never, not everything I do is, is, uh, is criminal. Not everything is a homicide. I may work on a case where a skeleton's been found in the woods and it's just... I don't know, an elderly person that wandered off and died in the woods and years later their bones are found. So not everything is criminal. But if it is a criminal case um, and someone is responsible for violence against a victim, yeah, it's nice to be able to testify. And I'm, I don't do it alone. I'm one member of a team that will contribute to perhaps the, the conviction and get somebody off the streets that shouldn't be out there. So you could be working on a scale of dealing with identifying one person, but you've also been involved with some extraordinarily large scale um, investigations, uh, natural disasters, and also you were involved with like, helping to identify bodies at Ground Zero for the 9-11 in New York. Yeah. How was that experience? That was a tough one. That physically, psychologically, Ground Zero was tough. And ironically, I spent um, my book, Fatal Voyage, which is my fourth book, came out in August of 2001. So I spent a year writing it, and then it's pretty much a year in production. And then a month after it was released, I end up at Ground Zero doing exactly what I'd been working on for the previous two years. So it was, you know, I, I was deployed with an official team, a government team. Um, we worked 13 hour deployments, just digging through the rubble, just trying to read. We didn't do any identifications on site, it was too fragmentary. My job was really just to see, because there were a lot of restaurants and some catering services in the front tower, just to see what was human, because we were getting a lot of animal bones. And then each day we would assign it a medical examiner number and tag it, and the ME van would come and pick it up each day, and then that was all done later by DNA. So how do you get on with something like that, you know, divorcing your mind from the emotional side of, wow, this incredible event has happened, um, this earth-changing event for us, and, and setting about your job? Well, you have to do it. I mean, you, if you can't be an objective scientist, you're not going to do your job very well and you're not going to do any of those victims any good. So you have to maintain a scientific objectivity. Now that doesn't mean that you're not going to think about it later, and some cases might come back. Some are harder than others. Um, when I was writing the book right before this one, His Bones Are Forever, and the opening scene is kind of a tough one. Tempe's called to the scene where a, a baby, a dead baby is found. And I, when I wrote that book, I was working simultaneously on three child homicide cases, an 11-month-old, a 2-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Yeah, so those are the tough ones. Those, for me at least, those are the real hard ones. Do you find that writing about them actually helps you process what you've had to deal with in your daily working life? Oh, I don't know. Um, the fun part is you get to solve everyone. <laughs> you know, is it necessarily true? Um, I know on the show, Tempe has these wonderful floor-to-ceiling, backlit, new site, no storage facilities. I have a closet. <laughs> and it's, it's got wooden shelves and cardboard boxes, and I hand write the little the case number on the five three by five index cards and slip it in the in the sleeve. But each one of those boxes is there because either the, the person has never been identified, or they've been identified and no one's ever been arrested if it's a homicide. So yeah, every case does not necessarily get solved. So we did Tempe appear on the scene for you. You, know, you had a career as a forensic anthropologist. 
when did he suddenly decide that I'm going to write about this? A number of things came together, I guess, around 1994. Um, I made full professor at the university, so I was free to do whatever the hell I wanted to do. And I did, <laughs> had a fantastic accomplishment. <laughs> I didn't want to do another textbook or journal article. And I had just done a serial murder case in Montreal, which involves some very interesting elements. Has anybody read Deja Dead? Where Tempe gives this lecture to Ryan about the saws and the you know, two billion kinds of saws there are in the world and how they leave different marks in the bones. Well, I had just worked on a serial murder case that involved some very interesting elements of, of uh, saws and dismemberment. So I had an idea. I had the freedom to try something new. And I just thought nobody had ever heard of forensic anthropology back then. Um, so I thought it might bring my science to a broader audience. So all of that kind of came together, and I thought I'd, I had never really written, I'd never written fiction. Well, maybe my resume a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't really written fiction. Or so. funding application. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll write this, and um, I got about two-thirds of the way through a manuscript in third-person voice. And I read it, and it seemed pretty slow to me. I let my best friend read it, and she said, this is so boring, and there's no <laughs> sex in this. There's <laughs> no sex in I don't remember her freezing. But I had to agree with her, and so I abandoned that. I started over, and then I switched to first-person voice. And for me, that just really worked, because it was like I was telling my own story through Tempe. So I wrote Deja Dead. It took two years, because I was working full-time, at teaching at university and then commuting between Charlotte and Quebec doing forensic casework. So I'd write it at six in the morning and you know on weekends and during vacations. So and I didn't tell anybody who's writing it because if you write a novel in an English department you're a hero. If you write a novel in a science department you're a little suspect. <laughs> so that's the book that became Deja Dead. So when you changed to the first person and started to sing for you was did Tempe kind of arrive fully formed, or, or did you have to sort of ease her in? Oh, I think I'm, yeah, I'm still developing her. I mean, she's not fully formed yet. She's, uh, one, of the, one of the problems you have with a continuing character, are you still over there, how those people still are? Yeah, that's a little way. They're making me nervous. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Can you keep your eye on Yeah, yeah, I'll make, I'll, if they make any sudden movements, I'll win. Okay, can you just give me one of these? Um, one of the problems you have in a continuing character series is, how much do you age the character? Um, she has to keep evolving. She has to keep changing. Her relationships have to keep changing. But what do you do about the fact that this is book 16? So in the first book, Tempe's a little bit north of 40. And in book 16, Tempe's a little bit north of 40. <laughs> <laughs> a little vague on that. Um, the cat is now like 57, I think. <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly. So. The other problem you have with a continuing character series is this may be the first book that a reader picks up. So in each book, you have to reintroduce the main premise, which is a forensic anthropologist, blah, 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 and the main characters. But this may also be the 16th book someone has read. So you have to do that in a creative and new way every time you do another book. So I think in this one, I do, I think I opened this one with uh, her testifying in court. Or no, she's for jury duty. So they're asking her questions. Um, I did it in one, she's sitting in a faculty department faculty meeting and dying of boredom, like shoot me in the head bored, which is really pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so she starts her autobiography. So I get, you know, you have to come up with a new way to get the information out there to the first time reader without boring the returning readers. And keep the returning readers um, excited about what could be happening in her life. Because exactly, they, yes. I have to say, she's a, she's a real person to many people and a well-rounded person. Well, a lot of people will say to me, you know, I really didn't like it when you did X, Y, and Z. And I just say, no, 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 no. That was Tempe. That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> they take it personally. Yes. <laughs> now, um, of course, you've had this wonderful wealth of stories from your work to draw on that come into your books. And I love the way in the back of your novels that you do have this almost like little spoiler alert, don't read this if you haven't read the book first, um, but this is how I came to this. So can you, um, you know, for everyone, just sort of outline 
how you corral so many potential possible ideas into to one solid novel? Well, I think I do what most writers do. Um, I draw on experiences that I've had or cases um, that I've worked on. Bones of the Lost does both. The idea, the idea for this came because I went to Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan with the USO, which is the United Service Organizations. It's an organization that exists to provide kind of extracurricular support to the troops, things like recreation centers and places they can go to use the internet. And maybe you, you remember the, the older ones amongst us, remember the old Bob Hope tours every year, Bob Hope and Ann Margaret. The older people can explain to the younger people what I'm talking about. <laughs> they go over and put on these big, you know, song and dance shows for the troops. Uh, starting way back in World War II. Um, so I, the Pentagon and the USO invited five authors to go um, to Afghanistan and Kurdistan just to thank the troops um, for their service there. So I went, and we went for a couple weeks, and um, with Sandra Brown and Clive Kessler and Mark Bowden um, and a, a writer from California. And we spent a lot of time um, flying around in Black Hawk helicopters, which is a very interesting experience sitting next to Mark Bowden, who wrote Black Hawk Down. <laughs> <laughs> and we're wearing our 40 pounds of body armor and our helmets and everything. And I want to, Mark, are we good? We're good. We're good. <laughs> He's calm, I'm calm. Um, so we went to forward operating bases at one point. We were right on the Pakistan border. And we went to thank the troops, and they spent their whole time thanking us for coming. So it was, you know, it was a really moving experience. So I decided that my readers might like to know what it's like to be in a war zone like that. And uh, the reason Tempe's asked to go there is that a young Marine lieutenant has been accused of murdering two Afghani civilians. He claims they were coming at him, and he shot in self-defense. Others at this chaotic episode in a village claim they were running away and he shot them in the back. So he's facing potential court martial for murder. So Tempe's asked to go and sort out what was the bullet trajectory. Did it go in the front and exit the back, or did it go in the back and exit the front? And that's uh, based on a case I worked on uh, years ago. A policeman was found dead of a gunshot wound in the chest. And the coroner ruled it a suicide. There was a lot of other circumstantial evidence. But the family insisted he'd been murdered. They insisted he'd been shot in the back because he was about to testify about um, corruption within that department. So years and years went by. They agitated and agitated. Finally, there was a government commission formed, and I was asked to do the exhumation and the analysis. So the question came down to exactly that. Did the bullet enter from the front, as the coroner had ruled, and exit the back, or did it enter the back, as the family insisted? So that's where the idea for... So, each story is drawn on bits and pieces of, of different things. This story opens, she's actually working on some mummified Peruvian dogs that have been confiscated by Border Patrol and they're thought to be illegally um, smuggled in antiquities. That came to me because, you know, every now and then something weird will come through my lab, like uh, a shrunken head. I, I, had, I had a couple shrunken head cases. And, um, you know, if their human remains are suspected to be, they, to be, they come to the corner. They are always either dogs or birds that have been made to look like human shrunken heads as a scam to sell to vulnerable tourists. So if you're in South America, do not buy the shrunken heads. That's too hard to get through border security. Yeah. Plus, they're dogs. It's probably, most likely it's a dog. So anyway, so that idea came to me from that. So everything is based on something I've done or been involved in. And of course, taking her over to Afghanistan, and you know, it's not as simple as um, excavation of bodies. There's so many political elements you were able to toss into this as well, and the addition of her getting to see her daughter. Yes, uh, Katie, we know from the other book, joined the army when her boyfriend was killed. He was over in Afghanistan during doing um, volunteer aid work over there. So she joined the army. Well, we now find out she's been deployed to Afghanistan, and part of the reason Tempe agrees to go over there is because she thinks she might be able to see Katie. And this is one of the lovely things too, you know, it, it's not just the one story, there's all these threads, there's Timmy's personal life coming through, as yeah. well as, you know, the, as well as the, the plot of the investigation and everything. Yeah, and there's also a hit and run uh, that she's working on in, in Charlotte, a young girl is found on a rural road, she's got no keys, no identification, they have no idea who she is. 
Um, it's obviously a vehicular death, but there's something wrong about the fracture pattern and when Tempe looks at the x-ray. So she's working on that with Skinny Slidell, who I don't know if you've read some of the previous books set in Charlotte. She's with Skinny, who's not the most flexible guy in the world. And Skinny right away decides this girl is an undocumented uh, hooker. And Tempe thinks maybe that's rushing to judgment a little bit. <laughs> Now, I do need to note, like, as a hardcore Kiwi, that you actually made a reference to rugby. Oddly enough, there were American rugby in this sport mentioned, and Kiwi sides gravel. We do get awfully excited when someone mentions Kiwi in the book. Well, I was visualizing when Sandra, Sandra was my roommate in Afghanistan at the Brown Air Force Base, and um, we were horrified <laughs> to learn, we both went, what? That we stayed in bee huts. These are these very rough, plywood huts that are thrown up uh, for the troops to stay in. And the bathroom was like two football fields away <coughs> over smooth, round little rocks. So as I'm picturing us hiking there, we both looked at each other and said, OK, if we have to go in the middle of the night, you know, what are we going to do? So we had our boots lined up and our flashlights and our helmets lined up. But as I pictured the rock that we had to walk over, it was nice, smooth, and it looked just like kiwis in my mind. So I called them kiwi-sized. I think that's what you're referring to. Yes. <laughs> we have kiwis in America. I don't need kiwis. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, um, we have Tempe that we're accustomed to reading about. But she made that grand leap to television. How did that happen? She did. Um, I have a lot of different agents. Um, I have a literary agent and a feature films agent and a TV agent. I have a video games agent. I have a speaking <laughs> agent. I have an action figure agent. I have oh, uh, action figures? Action Seriously? figures, yeah, theme parks, you name it. So um, my TV, we had some offers for feature film and TV. None of them was really the right offer. But my TV agent called and said, I'm talking with these two. Uh, Barry Josephson and Park Hansen, and I think this might be a good fit. So I met with them, and we were all on the same page. We wanted a character-based show. We didn't want just another police procedural. We wanted, you know, a show where you get invested in the characters and follow the, the lives of the characters. We wanted humor in the show. It's important I put humor in my books. Um, and that's a balancing act. That's tough, because we're dealing with violent death every week, and yet, you know, we, we put humor in, you have to be very delicate with it so you don't appear to be glib or, or um, disrespectful. We've actually been called a crimity. <laughs> and, and they genuinely wanted my input. So it just seemed like a good fit. So I went with it, and um, we're in season nine, so something's working right. Plenty working. Mm -hmm. And for those that follow the show and also read your books, there is actually quite a difference between TV Tempe and book Tempe. Now, was this something that you were consciously able to do, or was that out of your control and television galloped away with your character? We had an agreement. I knew when I, uh, when I agreed to go with Fox that they tend to be a younger demographic, at least in the US. Um, I drew the line, you're not making her a 22-year-old psychic, you know, for something like that. <laughs> so she is younger on the TV series. Um, she is... Uh, Taller. Very demoralizing when I have to have a photo shoot with Emily Deschanel. She's like a billion years younger and 200 feet taller than me. <laughs> she's not very socially polished. Um, her people skills really, really need some work. She's very awkward socially. Uh, we wanted a unique character on the show. I, whereas TV in the books is, has become a little more sophisticated and, and has gotten the rough ed edges polished off, I think. Um, I think of the TV show as a prequel. It's like an earlier point in Tempe's life, whereas here she's somewhere north of 40 and it's later. In the TV show, she's working in Washington, D.C., which I find very appropriate because the very first skeleton I ever handled was at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., which we are obviously drawing on. We were going to call it the Smithsonian right down. It, it came time to film the pilot and to put the logos on the truck and on the lab coats. And the Smithsonian lawyers never said no, but they never said yes. So we went ahead and called it the Jeffersonian. So um, I like that there's a difference, because when I go to write a Temperance Brennan book, I don't have to be impacted by what TV Tempe is doing. I can go ahead and write my book Tempe without worrying about all that.
That's good, because I was going to ask, you know, has she subtly managed to influence you anyway, because you have this massive television audience following now with their own level of expectation. Does that not just sneak its way in slightly? Um, well, not really. Um, writing for television is quite different in many ways, many, many ways, for, from writing um, a novel, so I really just click into a different... One difference is that when I write a novel, I don't really tell anyone what I'm doing. I will be somewhere along when my publisher wants a title and wants to know kind of the general theme of it so that they can do cover art and marketing and that sort of thing. But otherwise, I turn it in when it's finished and, you know, my editor tells me, well, that's splendid, and then, you know, we move on. <laughs> that's not the way it works with TV. Um, TV, you have a lot of bosses to answer to. You have to answer to the executive producers. You have to answer to the studio. You have to answer to the network right on up to God, I think. Everything has to be approved. Another difference is um, you do it collectively. When I write, it's the classic picture of the lone author sitting at the computer by themselves, you know, people. When you write an episode, I just finished doing one with my daughter, um, you go into, first you pitch your idea, and your idea has to be approved. And then you go into the writer's room and do what's called breaking the story. And when you go into our writer's room, there are two walls that are covered with terrifyingly empty erasable boards. And they're divided into six, because our show is in six scenes. And together, you hammer out your A story and your B story and your C story. So that by the end of anywhere from one to three weeks, you have on the walls, you have an outline of how your show is going to work. And then you pitch that to the showrunner. And if that's approved, then you get to write about a 15 to 20 page single spaced um, outline. And then when that's approved, then you get sent to script. You actually write the script. And that's just for one episode? Mm -hmm. All that for and one. then they change everything. <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote one. It's just, this is kind of funny. Oh, this is fun. Uh, the one I wrote for season nine is called The Dude in the Dam. And in it, I've embedded five clues from Bones of the Lost. So if you watch the episode and you pick up on the five clues, you get on, I don't know if we're doing it on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and the first, I don't know, 20 people, 100 people, whatever, win stuff. They win something. <laughs> so watch the episode and listen for the, the clues that are, that are out of this. But I started that episode, um, my daughter and I. We had this great opening scene. There was going to be this kid come in on an ATV and he was going to go airborne and come crashing down into this big puddle of slime, which was made by leopard slugs. And you hadn't done that before? We had not done this. We had not had a body in leopard slug slime. So it was, it was good. We were very excited about it. Leopard slugs will put out massive, they will scavenge on a corpse, and they will put out this massive amount of slime. So this guy was coming crashing down and going, eh, with slime all over. We loved it. It was such a Hodgins kind of thing to do. That got changed to two kids walking through the woods, discovering a body in a beaver dam. <laughs> Why? Budget. You don't have to pay a stunt driver. You don't have the medics there for the stunt driver. You don't have to crash an ATV. But slime is so much more fun. Well, we still have the slime, because we could have the slugs. We could have the leopard slugs. And here, here was a problem, though. Unbeknownst to us, unbeknownst to me, there are only three working beavers in Los Angeles. <laughs> and right down to the last minute, it was really touch and go. And our props people had constructed this wonderful beaver dam. We had a gully. We filmed this on location. We had a big gully and this big beaver dam, and then they would let the water go, blah. Well, the last minute, one of the beavers had a cancellation, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> there was the Narnia movies. <laughs> we got our beaver, and we were told this and any time you have animals, you have to have a wrangler. So we had slug wranglers, and we had beaver wranglers. <laughs> and um, we were told this beaver was a bolter, that as soon as the wrangler opened the cage, it would take off. So we're all ready for that. <clears throat> it turned out it was a very elderly beaver. <laughs> so we'd cue the water, and the water would come, and, we put, and the beaver would just sit there. <laughs> So when you see the opening scene, the beaver is not the most active participant. This, this day was a, uh, this is a little off topic, but it's kind of funny. It was a director's nightmare because we filmed um, the beaver scene on location in a park. And anytime you have animals, it's a director's nightmare because there's so many variables they can't control. 
We also were filming a scene of about 30 children in a park. Oh my God, children and animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't know this, but my daughter had signed up my grandson, who's two and a half, to be an extra, to be one of the kids in the park. And I thought, are you crazy? He's two and a half. You have to repeat the scene again and again and again for hours. And you have to be in the same place and do the same thing over and over and over. Well, he listened to the director. He listened really intently. So he was a kid on the slide. So our director said, now, Declan, when I yell action, you go down the slide. He's great. He's found the, pro the only problem, every time Kevin would yell action, Declan would yell action and then go down the slide. <laughs> <laughs> so he may end up on the cutting room floor, but he, he got his first check. <laughs> anyway, it's called the dude in the dam. <laughs> you didn't scream, Grandma! No, he was amazing. I couldn't believe it. So. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of fun with this whole collaboration with the, the television and, and <coughs> the series for the bones. So, do you enjoy one over the other? The writing books by yourself in isolation with a snoring cat to the collaborative effort where you actually have to give up some of your... Um, Power. The ones yeah, yeah I, I like it both. I, I really, I've had a really good time with the show. Um, I'm not one of these authors that's going to whine, you know, that they took my books and they destroyed them. Um, we've had a, everybody. Our writers are incredible. They're fantastic. We have, I think, eight full-time writers, and our on-screen people, Emily Deschanel, you couldn't meet a nicer human being on the planet. And T.J. Time is, you know, I'm secretly in love with. If, if he asks, I may run off with T.J. We all do. Boreanaz is not too hard on the hands and the eyes. <laughs> I appeared in one episode. Uh, I appeared in the, in the second season. It was called um, Judas on a Pole. It was the episode in which Zach, remember when we had Zach for the first three years? It was the one in which he finally got it together and was doing his dissertation defense. And I played the part of one of his very stern professors on his dissertation committee. And um, when the executive producer said, I want you to you know, play a small part, I said, no, I'm, that's not me. I'm not an on-camera kind of, kind of person. He said, no, I'm going to write it. And if you don't want to do it, I'll cast it. And I said, that's fine, Hart, but I'm not going to do it. And he said, David Duchovny's directing. I said, I am there. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to be directed by David Duchovny. Nice. Now mentioned earlier that you were collaborating with your daughter with doing screenplays for the Bones TV series, but you've also collaborated with your son for a book series, teen fiction, um, called the Viral Series. Right. How on earth do you get on collaborating with a child? Because I'm sure we argued for years over things like bedtimes and stuff like that. How do you agree on the creative process of writing a book with one? Well, not only that, but both my daughter, Carrie, and my son, Brendan, are lawyers. Oh, so they argue a point very well. They refer to themselves as recovering attorneys. Because neither one practices law. They're both... Uh, yeah, it works... I think it works out well. Um, he's very, because Tori Brennan is Temperance Brennan's 14-year-old great niece. And she and her friends live kind of isolated because their parents work for a veterinary research institute in Charleston, South Carolina. So they have to live on an island kind of far out. So the only four teenagers out there are Tori and three boys. So those are her, her best friends. So the premise, um, my son came to me having practiced law a total of two years and decided this is not what he wanted to do, um, which is putting it mildly. He hated it. Uh, he came up, he said, look, there are a lot of kids coming to your signings. There are a lot of kids watching the show. Maybe kids would like to read about kids using forensic science. So um, we proposed that to a publisher, and they liked the idea, but they wanted some, the kids are really into grounded fantasy. We wanted some element of fantasy, and we weren't going to do vampires, and we weren't going to do zombies. I'm going to say <laughs> So what we did is, in the first book, the kids um, rescue, I'll make it real short, they rescue a puppy, and they don't know that this puppy has been the experiment of illegal parvovirus experimentation. Are you familiar with parvovirus? Mm -hmm. It's yes. deadly for puppies. And um, in these illegal experiments, the DNA of the parvovirus has been altered. Normally, people can't catch canine parvovirus, but this transmits to humans, and the kids catch it. So the dog recovers, the kids get sick, they recover, but they notice that they've been altered. 
the, parvo, the altered parvovirus DNA has entered their own DNA. So now they have canine sensory abilities way beyond human. They can see things the human eye can't see. They can hear things like a wolf. They can smell if someone is lying or if someone is afraid. So the premise is they take these wolf-like abilities and they combine them with their love of science to solve cold cases. And so that's the premise. There's virals, um, seizure, code, and the fourth one will be out soon. That will be called exposure. So you know, just as well as writing a temperance Brenham novel a year and a collaborating <laughs> on a virals novel a year and having a career as a forensic anthropologist and zapping backwards and forwards between Charlotte and Quebec and producing a TV show. What else do you do with your spare time? Well, I am a producer. If you notice our crawler, we have a lot of producers. <laughs> um, I do what everybody does, nothing special. I like to, I have a beach house. I like to go down there, spend time. All of a sudden, I went from none to four grandchildren. So there's, I, my life is never going to be the same. I'm back into having molded plastic play things all over the place. So I like to go to the beach and spend time with, with the kids and, and I play some tennis. I'm trying to learn to play golf. I, yeah. I um, can't really say I enjoy that yet. But. Long walk spoiled. Yeah, yeah. And yet you, and you find time to write the novels and fit in touring, which I, can I please say we are so appreciative that you have come all the way over here to come and talk because not too many writers do. So. <laughs> no, this is my sixth visit to New Zealand. Oh, wow. Six. And not just for writers' things. I was talking right. the other day with some of my forensic studies out of the dental school, and you've actually come and talked to the dental forensic scientist people here as well. So yeah. you've combined your yeah. academic and professional career as well as your creative career. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, I think at this point we will open for questions from the audience. I want to hear from the I, I know. I have been keeping an eye on them. My hand did almost drift to my ear once when the lady in the blue started twitching. Uh, I think you're quite safe. Is she armed? But she got her arms crossed, you're fine. Yes, the gentleman here. The cold case she mentioned of the question we got from the front of the room was what was, uh, what the, was result the result of the cold case? Um, it was one of the most clear cut examples of a bullet entrance exit that. I've ever worked on. The bullet went in the front. When a bullet goes in, it goes in pretty clean, but when it comes out, when it exits, it pulls with it the fragments of bone. And this was a classic pattern. It had gone in the front and had exited the back. Suicide or homicide? I couldn't tell him that, but I could definitely rule out the story that the family was insisting on. He had not been shot in the back. Any other questions? Don't be shy. This Don't is also going to be on the exam. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'd have to ask the DNA people. I think if you worked, and, but it's getting much, much, much faster. I think if you worked on a sample full time around the clock, you went right to the front of the queue, and you had an analyst just doing your thing, I think you could turn it around in a couple of days. Is there anybody else here that knows better? Um, oh, actually, sorry. <laughs> they had um, just an article, the university has just purchased a machine that can do one day turnover. Mm -hmm. But they made the point there that it uses $35,000 worth of chemicals at any one go, so speed comes with price. Mm -hmm. Come on, people. <laughs> you know you want to know stuff. There will be a pop quiz at the end. <laughs> I'm Sandy. I'm a student at um, Prague University, and this year I'm doing honours, and I'm just completing my dissertation. So oh, you congratulations! So you'll enjoy the thesis events. Yeah, we don't have to answer the questions, though. You know, we just live here. So I have a question for you because my dissertation is on the paupers in Northern Cemetery. I found a, um, about nearly 2,000 people up there, and I'm looking at them in conjunction with poverty in the 19th century here in Dunedin. And I got um, the case of, of several of them, and, and I talked to a funeral director, and he said to me that, you know, from the time of death sort of to two days burial, a body actually takes quite a long time to decompose, and he mentioned a time frame of even up to 80 years and more. 
What would you say to that? Well, I respectfully would disagree. <laughs> it depends entirely on the conditions to which that body is exposed. Yeah. I have seen bodies in South Florida where the birds went to work on them that have become skeletonized in less than a week. Right. I have also seen you know, bodies that were buried 30 years ago, embalmed, with the water flowing properly around and not into and pooling in the coffin that are completely preserved, just like they've been buried the day before. So there's just so many variables. Mm -hmm. Access by scavenging animals and um, certain types of bacteria, water, temperature, temperature, temperature is very, very important. Soil acidity on the surface, under the surface, in the water. I mean, that's what the body farms have been established mm -hmm. to study. That's what I thought, because a lot of them are on the slope, mm -hmm. under trees, it's very, even now, it's very wet and moist in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I talk about that in this book. Uh, oh, she, cool. <laughs> she goes to exhume, and within the same cemetery, right. the two victims have been subjected to very different I compositional events. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Actually, I'm just going to pop in another quick question. You were mentioning the book there in the cemetery. I'd just like to state for the record that there's some pretty awful things to poor Tempe. Yeah, Tempe takes a lot more risks than I do, though. Um, yeah, she gets hit on the head and she gets, yeah, it's true. I haven't actually uh, encountered the physical. When I went to uh, testify in the genocide uh, in Rwanda, that was under witness protection. So that was a little tense, a little dicey. Um, I was threatened one time in court. I was testifying, um, it would, and the defendant didn't particularly like what I was testifying to. He had killed this girl. He had been accused of killing this girl from, and dismembering her. And then she floated ashore in two different j jurisdictions across this big river. Um, so they had to, to break up the, they took a recess, and the prosecutor said, well, go upstairs, I'll come up and get you. There's a problem. So I thought the lawyers were arguing over, you know, whatever lawyers argue over. And he came, came upstairs and he said, well, the defendant says he's going to kill you. So, so we can't bring police in to the courtroom because it would be prejudicial to the defendant. So um, if he comes at you, which apparently he'd done in the past, if he comes at you, um, don't get out of the witness box. Well, I had already decided what I was going to do. Is I was going to jump behind a judge. <laughs> I'm just going behind a judge. <laughs> But no, I don't get into nearly the scrapes the Tempe gets into. Question from the lady at the back. <laughs> I was, um, I mean, on paper, I mean, your career has been really spectacular. You know, it kind of seems that like you've achieved a lot of, you know, multiple things that a lot of people would dream to kind of reach in terms of respectability level, in terms of kind of how far you've come. Is there anything that you haven't done? that you'd love to do? I never got to be a prima ballerina. <laughs> yeah, maybe a NASCAR racer. Ooh, Ooh, did a sailboat, NASCAR. sailboat racer. That's what I have to do in the next book. It's all kind of frustrating. <laughs> Come on, I admit it. If the race had been postponed and scheduled for right now, how many of you would be here? <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the rare times in my life I was really very, very quiet because my wonderful publicist got me into the Royal New Zealand Yacht Slapping <laughs> to watch it. I think I was probably the only American in there. <laughs> I was really quiet. But no, I was rooting for the. I was rooting for you guys. But they didn't get you on a ride on the boat. No, I didn't get you a ride. You need to talk to your publicist. I did once crew on, a, on an American's Cup boat, not during. America's Cup, but they retire some of them to St. Martin in the Caribbean, so I, and you can pay to, to crew in a race. Yes, hi. My daughter's been reading the Byron's book, and we were thinking it would make a really great movie. Any plans or TV series for that? Well, we're in discussions. Um, my son wants to do a feature film. He has this image of himself in a beret with a big, you know, fog kind of thing. <laughs> And I, I had such a good time with television, I think I prefer to do television, but we're still, we haven't reached any kind of agreement. We'll see. He's good at, 
My son is very good at some things. You asked about the process. Um, the, the Tory Brennan books are equally as complex as the Temperance Brennan books. And I don't know if you have them here, but they're thicker than a lot of, of the Temperance Brennan books. The stories are very complicated stories. Um, the difference is that the main characters are younger, so the dialogue is different, obviously, and the social concerns are different. So my son is really good at that. He, you know, I'll, I'll write, I'll have the kids saying something like, wow, that's really keen, you know, and he'll go, oh, God, no. <laughs> so, um, and he's very good at, at, you know, the technologies, the social media, the, the, you know, the kids are using today. So, and then I'm good at plot twists and, and the science end of it, so we really um, collaborate very well. I didn't answer your question earlier. Our creative meetings can be somewhat uh, heated at times because what we do is um, he writes parts, I write parts, and then we print it out. The book is in quarters. We print it out each quarter, and I take hard copy and I do what he calls murder his art, <laughs> <laughs> and then we discuss the changes, and then he makes them. So. He does actually make them. He makes most of them. Every now and then he'll, he'll, he'll argue a point and I'll say, okay, you're probably right. It's just my preference of a word versus his preference of a word. Mm. you got to give him small victories. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what would you say Yeah, ethical or practical issues, uh, working, writing fiction as opposed to being uh, a scientist. And I do that under two different names. Um, I write my fiction under Kathy Rice, but my textbooks, my scientific work, it's Kathleen J. Rice. I don't, I'm sure you've all picked up on that. I'm sure you've all read Osteology, <laughs> the events of the <laughs> um, I was, to, but there's never been a problem. Um, ethical issues involved, I take my ideas from cases that I've worked on or things I've done, but I change all the details. I change all the names and the places and the dates, and I just take that core idea of dismemberment involving a unique pattern of approach, and then I ask myself, well, what if? What if this? What if that? And then spin it off into fiction. Now, one time, a practical, when I testify in court, that always, we talk about it, whichever side I'm, I'm testifying for, um, and one time I talked about it with the prosecutor, and, you know, is it going to be a problem that you write fiction? No, Dr. Roberts, is that fact or fiction? <laughs> so um, I got it in the courtroom and got sworn in. I sat down. The first thing my eye falls on is a copy of Deja Dad on your defense counsel's table. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. He never brought it up. He did examination, cross-examination. I was excused. The only thing, he brought it up to me afterwards and he wanted me to sign his book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's actually a very nice moment to end our interview today. So, um, again, I'd like to everyone to join me in thanking Kathy Rose for coming to New Zealand.